Well, hello. How's everybody doing today? Happy Wednesday. Um, we are officially in fall season and it feels good. I feel like um, here in LA, it's finally gotten kind of like cool and we're having some overcast days. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm very ready for that time of year. You guys know I like to live in Christmas most of the year. And so it's nice when Christmas finally catches up to me. Um, let's see, today I'm actually apart from my co-host, so I'm going to invite her into the chat. Um, so welcome Fish into the room. And this will be exciting because I haven't talked to Fish in a few days, which you guys know is not normal for us. We usually see each other every day. Um, and sh gosh, Fish, can you hear me? Are you there? Hmm. Maybe not. Fish? Let's see. Well, I can't hear her. I don't know if anyone else can hear her. Um, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Okay. Oh. Well, I'm throwing my AirPods in the trash. I don't know. They just don't work anymore. <laughs> oh, no. That's like the eighth time that I have gone to use them and spent like 30 seconds yelling at my phone. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. The the problems of our century are just hilarious. Like yelling at electronics, like trying to make Seriously. it work. And being upset. It's you know, it's a daily occurrence for me. I feel like I've like dated myself and feeling like an old woman because Bluetooth rather than being a convenience for me is more of an annoyance in my life. Um, which I think oh means gosh, you're yes. old, right? It's awful. I made the mistake and you and I drive you know, similar cars. Um, I made the mistake. So maybe this, maybe you'll understand this. That I made the mistake of um, hooking my phone up so that when I enter my car, it connects via Bluetooth. No, don't do that. Don't make my I mistake. That. I hate that. <laughs> Pretty much on anything, there's an automatic connect to Bluetooth. I'm like, no, because half the yeah. time it works, half the time it doesn't. But again, I, I just feel like this means that we're kind of old. We're old. Like, that sounds like something my mom would have struggled with when I'm like, mom, it's easy. It makes your life better because it just connects automatically. And my mom would be like, I don't know. You know, now I've become <laughs> that person that modern technology annoys me more than it conveniences me. So, and that's not even modern. Like, Bluetooth has been around for a long time. Yeah, for a very long time. Yeah. No, I think that's been, since you started the show, that's kind of been our, like, reoccurring theme is that we're old. Maybe we need yeah. to like lean into it. We don't oh, need no. to lean out. You know what I mean? Either you need to yeah. accept it or be like, hey, I'm not going to define myself by this. I think that's probably the better answer. You know, yeah. like, I'm not going to let this define me. I'm not like, you know, I'm yeah. young forever, whatever, which I know we feel in certain ways. Like, but um, oh. other times it's just fun to make fun of yourself a little bit. And I woke up at six this morning and I started unpacking boxes because I just moved into a new house. And at um, 6 p.m., I laid down on the floor and I died. Um, oh, my soul God. left my body and ascended, oh, I guess, to heaven yes. and then back again. And here I am. So I no longer have the youth and the stamina to, to do this. <laughs> well, wow. First of all, that was incredibly dramatic and um, heartbreaking. <laughs> your soul left your body. Um, like, how long did it take for it to return? I just have so many questions. Yeah, no, it was it was um, an experience for sure. I I blacked out during the whole thing though, so I couldn't tell you. I've got no answers. Uh, I was gonna say the best part about those you know death experiences is I love hearing people like reading books about people's experiences when they have like literally died in this life yeah. and they get to the other side they see a lot of stuff. Unlike you, you're useless to me. But usually yeah, they see. Um, a lot of stuff. That's true for a lot of reasons, actually. Oh, sad. You know, but then they come back and they're like these new rejuvenated, you know, humans yeah. with a new sense of life and wonder because they've seen like the greatest perspective anyone could ever see, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a show on, on Netflix that I watched over the pandemic. Um, oh my gosh. I'm going to have to Google it real quick. And I want to ask if you've seen it. Uh, let's well, see. Near death experiences. I would love. So I, I need to watch this. Netflix. I'm Googling quickly. Netflix. Uh, surviving Death. Oof. It was a good watch. Very oh. good watch. What did the people say? Like, what was their kind of common denominator? Um, it was a multi-episode, like, mini docu-series. And what hooked me on it is that um, 
the the documentary filmmakers interviewed people who had near death experiences, but some of them were like one of them was like a neurosurgeon who mm-hmm. had um an incident that happened to him, and you know he was angry about it because he obviously wasn't a believer in that stuff until it happened to him. And then he became obsessed with trying to understand what happened to him. So it's right. stuff like that. It's it's the experiences of people who were otherwise skeptics of whatever it was that they experienced. Yeah. You know, my my friend actually, someone I, I know, like she was in a surgery and she died and you know her heart stopped. And she oh said God. that you know, when she came back, um, but she said that what she experienced was so fascinating because she left her body and she felt the weight of everything she carried in life leave. Like she was like, it's amazing how heavy our bodies are and how much, you know, like emotional heaviness, not only physical, but emotional heaviness. She's like, I just felt so light. And, you know, and she said that, there was like this almost inner dialogue that was happening between her. Like part of her was like, mm. I want to stay here. I never want to go back to that body um, because yeah. it's so heavy and this feels so free. And then the other half of her was like, you have children, you have a husband. And she's like, but oh it's okay. God. I can look out for them up here and they'll soon join me. Like she just had this perspective oh of like freedom that, yeah. you know, I, it was really interesting and then she made the choice to go back to her body like um oh my goodness but like such a wild concept that there you know our, our lives seem so controlling and so finite and like everything exists so real to us right here but like just you know you hear these stories about people that go to the other side and you know it's so true that like so many of this, the things that we worry about so much like they don't really matter you would think yeah, you know? yeah. i don't know it's pretty cool. i definitely uh I've definitely dipped my toe into nihilism a little bit and I have to be careful there because it's, it's a rabbit hole if you jump in. So I try not to for sure. Yeah. yeah. We don't, we want, don't oh, want to jump too far and like, you know, have our souls leave our bodies like yours yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Um, on another, how is the move going? So fish is um, basically moving a lot of her stuff across country. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my boyfriend moved his entire life. He, bought a house and I am I moved most of my life but obviously I jump back and forth now I I don't know what that means but I jump back and forth now and will probably be living out of a suitcase for a little while so it's been going okay um our move in was pretty bad uh the movers were not great so we ended up doing a lot more work than we thought we were going to which is why I think my 34 year old body has begun to shut down um yeah at what point do I start? Can I like, I'm, I feel good saying 34 right now, but I turn 35 soon. So like, should I say 35 year old woman? Am I? What? 35 just rolls off the tongue a little bit better. You know, you just want me to get a little bit closer in age. <laughs> right now that I'm 36, I'm like, come join me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That coffin in your snow waltz video will just slowly crawl into that and make ourselves comfortable yeah it's in my garage now it's I ready. I what are you gonna do with that i don't know i actually posted the video of you know that we did on the set of yeah. us getting the coffin and i jokingly said in the comments like what should i do with this coffin now i own it and some of the comments were so funny somebody said <laughs> like put pillows in it and make it a bed for Amy Lee when she comes to visit. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my favorite one. But there was, you know, there's some good suggestions in there. I did think about making it like a almost like a lay-in couch. Like you're just like sitting in this vat of pillows, a coffin of pillows and you can like I mean your house is so rad. I feel like we're doing it a disservice by not putting more of your very fun music video things in it. You yeah, know what I, I mean? Stained glass. Like I should have yeah. put it somewhere. Like, why didn't you think oh of that? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm becoming a hoarder. So, yeah. <laughs> you gotta be careful. Um, That's true. Well, we do have a very special guest today. As I, I don't know if you saw in my story, but, um, my Instagram story, I was really talking him up. I, I just wanted everybody to be prepped for the amazingness that's about to ensue. And then I realized that I kind of spoiled it with the title of this. Yeah, a little bit. 
I just, I have a question and I assume he's listening, so I'm not going to ask, but did you give him the thing? No, I didn't give him the thing yet. I, okay. I, Sammy, you're okay. I'm going to invite him on. Okay. Before I start talking at him, I'm going to talk to him. So we're going to invite <laughs> Sammy Seaver on. As you see from the title of this, he is not only a massive celebrity, as I said on my Instagram story, he's also my day to day manager. So bring on Sammy. Oh, there he is. Hello, Samuel. How are you today? Well, if it isn't Lindsay Sterling. Oh, my best friend. At Lynn Seafish. <laughs> Hello. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're so happy to have you to chat with us. This makes me feel like it's a little bit of a reunion from our France trip. Yes. Oh, that's true. We just need to get our, our driver that was, uh, <laughs> that couldn't really speak any English, but loved the vibes that we were giving off, too. Uh, can we just talk about how cool our driver was? Like, I like fell in love with him on that trip. <laughs> he was so yeah. special. We we have a lot of photos. Uh, I don't know how much you want to tease of what that part of the France trip was, um, but at some point you're gonna have to give the full story of the mysterious France trip and the driver that was there. <laughs> oh well, I think we can share the the driver's story now. Uh, yeah. Because well, I think we've already kind of talked. Like, oh, have we? Oh gosh, I can't remember. I don't know. That's a good. It's like checking the timeline in like a TV series to see if we've re made the re reveal yet. <laughs> right. Yeah, oh we've definitely we, we haven't talked about what, what it was for. We won't share what it was for, but we can share that we were in France recently. We did we we did some projects, and um, yeah, we were driving all over the place. And um, I don't know. Do you, Sammy? Do you want to tell a little bit about like? that experience or our our driver absolutely whatever i just have to say the the funniest thing to me is how recognized you are in france and how none of us really expected it it was like we we were in a million different towns throughout france and no matter even if it was like a very small one people would just come up to you and be like oh it's it's lindsay sterling like they've known you for forever and they're like let's take some photos um, so much so that I think we, we called you a local regional celebrity uh, by the end of it, and we allowed you to have that title. Yes, very flattering. I was like, yes, I local celebrity right here, girl from France. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we when we were in France, we tried to organize uh, a music video. As in classic uh, Lindsay Sterling fashion, you were like, oh, we're in France, let's just shoot a music video. Sure, like how hard could it be? Um, <laughs> so. Me, Fishman, and our director, RJ, kind of like started to like map out like it was the amazing race or something. Like, how are we going to get to all of these destinations by 3 p.m. and win the, you know, the challenge for that day? Um, and in doing so, we kind of realized at a certain point that none of us would be able to drive uh, competently in France. So we just, we got a, a driver um, that came on and oh my god, I'm blanking on his name. Do do either of you remember? Oh my gosh. I don't. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna look it up in, in our I next break. We, I know that we like struggled to pronounce it occasionally. <laughs> yeah, we were all afraid to say it because we yes. weren't sure we had it right. Yes. Oh, it was, it's spelled like Johan, but I think it yeah. was Yo Johan, right? Yawn, like it was like one Yawn. syllable, Yawn. Yeah. and my tongue couldn't yeah, make yeah. the shape that it needed to make to actually say it properly. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, but he was amazing. Yeah, that he was trip so was good, so magical. And it's funny, I was actually just on a Zoom today with the colorist, and he was coloring this video, and he was like, "Wow, the locations in this are incredible." And I was like, "Oh, I'm going to see if he's impressed." And I, so I was like, "Hey, we actually filmed this all in one day." And he was shocked. He's like, "Are you kidding me?" Because <laughs> there's so many locations. And it's like it looks like you traveled like all over the place to film this. And I was like, "Well, that's cuz I had a dream team of a manager named Samuel Seaver." <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Anytime you need an international video, you know, uh, I'm the person to call. You're my guy now. It still um, blows my mind that we did that all in one day. Like when I look at the map, how? How did we do that? 
Oh man, I a lot of luck. I think is the answer yeah. to that. A lot of, we had a lot of serendipity happen. Um, yes which was made it all the more magical. Like it kept raining, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about that, um, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't want to repeat ourselves, but it really was magical. And um, it'll, it'll probably always be one of my favorite, like international little, you know, stints. Yeah. It was really special. Um, I will never forget that man climbing that tree. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so anyway. So many little moments, but, Okay, I want to I want to back up a little bit since we have a star like Sammy on today. I want to focus a little bit on you, Sammy. Um, mm. So, I guess I just want to know because these are some things I've never actually asked you before. So, you know, and I think also this is a great conversation for people to hear because there's a lot of um, people in our community that want to get into the music industry or you know want to you know just I guess jump into any industry. And the message for today is if Sammy can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not true. <laughs> Thank you. It's a true <laughs> underdog story. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not the message for today. But I do think you have a really great like insight into what it takes right now currently because you basically got fresh out of college and then jumped right into the music industry like full force. So, but first of all, what made you want to be in the music business? Okay. That's a great question. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I like growing up, I, I honest, and let me know, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Okay. If it ever cuts out, it gives me the little red circle around my, uh, yeah. my name every now and then. So Are I'm, you I'm doing AirPods, AirPods if I need to take off the AirPods. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, Should discovering, I go AirPods? I'm discovering that AirPods and whatever the most recent amp update is, they're not talking well together. I, I took, I've tried mine twice now and it's the amp crashed on me. So Maybe no AirPods. Do you guys, do you guys go Wi-Fi or no, no Wi-Fi? I'm currently doing no Wi-Fi because my connection was showing red when I was connected to my Wi-Fi, but my Wi-Fi is fine. So I've been troubleshooting this whole time. Oh, By the way, this is the most entertaining part of this whole uh, dialogue. Okay, let me go no <laughs> Wi-Fi real quick, no AirPods, and then we're we're diving in. Okay. Yes. You know what he's doing right now, everybody? He's stalling. He doesn't have an answer to <laughs> a really tough, hard-hitting question. So he's stalling. Okay. I'm back. I hope that stalling moment was great. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's let's talk through the journey. Um, I grew up like not really in a music family. Um, we, you know, we were all big proponents of music. Uh, I have an older brother that considers I, I would consider a pretty good musician. Um, and so I, growing up, I really wanted to be an artist. Like I was, you know, I saw. Uh, a video of John Mayer when I was in middle school and I was like, yeah, that wouldn't be that hard. I could, I'll just do that. Like, that'll be a good, easy career choice. Um, <laughs> and turns out, hey, spoiler alert out there, it's not that easy of a career choice uh, to be a performing artist. Um, but <laughs> like, funny enough, I, I think like I, I got to see my older brother kind of, you know, move to L.A. and go into the music industry and got to see it through him and realized how much I had no, I just had no idea how music worked. I had no idea what a manager was or what a label was, you know, like I, I just, I knew next to nothing. And so when I went to college, I was like, I'm just going to buy a couple books and, you know, that'll probably be it. I'll figure it out and I'll have all the answers. And then I'll just, you know, I'll do the thing and call myself an artist from there. Um, uh -huh. Let's see. I accidentally muted myself. Um, as, I, as I read the books and did all the stuff, I was like, this is actually pretty interesting. Like, it might be, that's probably where... Lindsay, like you, the thing that captivates you is all of the creativity around it, like the music videos, editing, the like, you know, the design of everything. And for me, it was like, oh, cool. These deals are really interesting. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just loving it. And I like, I really loved the, the business side of, of the industry. And so like my recommendation if anyone's interested in the music industry is just to like try as many different things as possible like you know try to get an internship at your local college and put on a show or you know try to like volunteer at a music festival like you can mm. do a lot of really weird like i just i didn't know what my path was going to be so i just 
signed up for anything that I could and was like, sure, God, I don't know. That sounds fun. I'll try that out. Um, and then I kind of, you know, stumbled into management when I was in, in college. And that's when I was like, ah, okay. My like heart is set here. I want to work for a manager and a management company as soon as I leave college. And then that uh, kind of brought me to where I am now on this AMP show. There you go. This is the peak right here, by the way, being on my AMP show. This is it. This is, it. This is, the, this is Everest. <laughs> this is why he has worked more, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, what you say is so, so, so true. How important it is to try as many different parts of the job that you want to do. Like, I think that there is so much to be said for understanding how each of the roles work. And the more as an artist, even that I understand about like, <clears throat> you know, whether it's making music videos or all the creative things I do, like how the music is made or, um, you know, but <clears throat> even going back to like when I first became an artist and I kind of was my own manager and I was booking my own shows, like the more you can learn about all the different pieces, the more well-rounded you're going to be. And also the more appreciation you have for those people and what it takes for them to do their jobs. But yeah, I loved what you said about just volunteering, saying yes, doing whatever you can to like put your foot in as many little doors as possible. Um, so that one, you can gain experience, but also figure out what is it that I like about this? What is it that I want to do? <clears throat> yeah, totally. Had, and like, oh, go, go for it, Fish. Oh, uh, I was just saying, I had, I had no idea getting into the music business, how many different jobs there were. Uh, it just, it blew my mind when I finally got involved to be like, oh, Oh, there's so much besides picking right. up a guitar or a microphone or something. Totally. And I'm curious, Lindsay, like what was what was your journey, not as an artist, but as learning the music industry? Because I'm like, there's so many young artists out there that like I'll you'll we'll see pop up. And you and I have talked about this before. And it's like, wow, this new artist is huge and they're only 23 or something like that. And I'm I'm just like, there's no way they could understand the music industry completely front to back at that point but like you've always had such a complete understanding of it because you've lived through all of it so long so i'm curious what your journey of like learning the music industry was like too oh gosh um <clears throat> you know, it's, I knew so little, like I knew nothing about it, you know, growing up in Arizona and then going to school in Provo, Utah, like I'd never even really lived in a big city before. And um, so I remember my first step into it was just like asking questions from like other artists that like would pass through Provo and play at these open mic nights and, or play at this venue called the Velour, like, you know, oh, they have a manager. I'm going to talk to their manager and see like what he can tell me about this industry. So it started by just asking questions to the people that I would have these little run-ins with, but also, um, I, you know, I got a book that was like how to make it in the music industry. And I read that book and was very discouraged after I read it. Cause I was like, oh my gosh, I do not have the connections or the money to do this. And so it was like looking at all the different options, you know, from, like I said, reading books to talking to people that were kind of doing it themselves to, you know, like literally just anywhere I could gain a little bit of knowledge. Like I would take people out to dinner and pick their brain if they were like, they worked for the media company at BYU, like whatever. I was just like, I need to learn and I'm going to talk to whoever I need to talk to. And, um, and it's like, if you talk to enough people soon, so-and-so introduces you to so-and-so that knows something about this. And, you know, before I knew it, I'd met these people that were like really influential learning about, you know, this new social media stuff. And so if you talk to enough people, eventually like the right door will open for you and you will find the right path. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's 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 great advice. I feel like the thing that like I had to learn too is I'm very much a person that likes to like, you know, learn about a situation before I dive in too. Like I'm a little bit yeah. more cautious. Like I, I don't I, I wanna like, you know, read about what that is before I just do it. And I think at a certain point, like with this career and I'm sure with any career, at a certain point you just have to do it. And like if you mess things up along the way, like that's part of it and you just like you have to be comfortable just knowing that you're gonna just go for it and who knows if that's the right decision or not but someday you'll right. be able to look back and be like oh man i wish we did that differently you know no it's so true eventually you do just have to like take that leap of faith and know that you're never going to be prepared for anything in life because you, you can prepare as much as you can but at the end of the day you're going to feel like you know nothing once you start 
Like, um, you know, so actually that takes me to like, my next thought is that you came like straight out of college and then went right into working for <clears throat> the best management company in the business, if I dare say so myself. Um, you know, but I mean, they've got some pretty reputable artists from like, you know, John Legend to Charlie Puth. Like, so it wasn't, you know, you, you really did jump into the full arena. And so I guess, what was that like? And how did you make that jump? Like, how did you get that job? Totally. Um, yeah, so that was such a funny period. I, um, to take like a step back to when I was, when I was in college, I like all I wanted to do was get a job at like one of these companies that you'd recognize, like the average person on the street, if you were like, universal music, they'd probably be like, Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Like, I was like, I want to get a job at like, something mm. that big. And I just, I couldn't, it was crazy. Every single year I'd apply to like 30 different internships for the summer and was, oh I would have, I was like I'll be unpaid, you know, just get me over to LA. I just want to move to LA. I wasn't from yeah. there originally. Um, and I just, I could not get a gig. And so I like, I remember being really discouraged when I was in, in school and like Googling as much as I can of like, how do you actually just get into the music industry if you're like an outsider? Um, and honestly, it's just like at the end of the day, it was kind of just persistence and eventually you get lucky. Like it's, it's that saying of like opportunity is when luck or wait, opportunity is when, wait, my tell me, quote. what is it? It's my favorite quote. Hold on. It's an Oprah quote. Let me find it. Oprah. I'm Googling again. <laughs> luck is when opportunity meets experience, right? Yeah. I believe luck is preparation meeting opportunity. If you hadn't been prepared when the opportunity came along, you wouldn't have been lucky. Thank you, Fish. That was exactly what I was going to say. You said it better than I could have said it myself. Um, no, no, no. Oprah said it better than anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, like, I, I tried to apply through every single, like, opening that I could. And literally, I got to, like, the last week of school senior year i was graduating and i had no job i, I couldn't get a single interview anywhere and so I, I went on facebook and i was like i'm gonna just start like applying to anything i think like joining just music industry groups and just dming people and stuff and i literally got this job through a facebook post <laughs> and which is I, wild <laughs> crazy right like you think that like you read everything, you go to classes and everyone tells you about how to prep your resume and apply to jobs. Like I literally got this through Facebook. That's so crazy. That just blows my mind, especially because that is not where I would see Adina hiring someone from just like personally knowing <laughs> yeah. her. I'm like, you know, it's almost shocking to me that that's, you know, where they found you. But again, it goes back to that point of like, if you talk to enough people, if you try enough things, if you don't give up, if you, you know, just keep knocking on every door and trying every different shape and every color of opportunity eventually like something will work and i think that sometimes the doors that we really want they don't open because maybe there's a better door for us you know maybe there's a better fit somewhere else and i i just look at the way you mesh with um the entire team over at friends at work and you know and we're so grateful to have you like i just think you're the perfect fit that we could have hoped for for that job Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 been so such a learning experience. Like like you said, like it's the life learning experience part of it too. Of like you have to be persistent. Like and it's it's a stuff that I've seen all of my friends go through the same thing as we've been graduating college and trying to find our footing too. And it's like it's the same as when I was in high school and I didn't know what college to apply to. And it's probably going to be the same thing in a couple years from now too. Like and it's just it's about like you know, persistence and also trying to look at the bright side of closed doors, like trying right. to see a closed door and say like, ah, oh, you know what, that's just, uh, you know, something that's, there's going to be another one that opens and I kind of just have to like pick myself up for it. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That's so, so true. I mean, everything that you just said, Sammy, is like one for one. Also my experience, particularly like just specifically in this business and in this industry and like the closed door thing, all of that. It, one for one, I absolutely agree with all of that. Well, and you know, it's interesting because I feel like the 
that's kind of the story that we all have. You know, it's like everybody loves hearing that, you know, oh, you persevered and made it. But it's like everybody has that version of their own story. And, you know, so it's just a good reminder to hear that other people have it because it's like we're all in this together. We're all going through it. Like, don't give up on whatever it is that you're pushing for, because it will happen when the time is right. The door will open. Um and speaking of like not being, you know, you, like you were saying earlier, Sammy, how you can never fully prepare for, you know, anything. Um, I want you to talk about your first week on the job and how many crazy things happened that there's no way you could have been prepared for. I swear your first week at Friends at Work was just the funniest roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> How, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the craziest part was like, I, I started and I still didn't completely understand um, what I was like, you know, what the actual industry was like from the inside. And I mean, it was like, I got, I got a little bit of preparation. And to clarify the the Facebook post was like a, you know, it was within a, a music industry group and I went through all the vetting. So it wasn't like, your team was just hiring some random person from Facebook. So it was like, <laughs> no, I know that. You know, I realize now how that sounds, but like it was, you know, we, they did the interviews. We, we kind of um, met so many times. And so when I started, the thing that was crazy is Artemis was like on a deadline to be uh, delivered your album. And mm. so as soon as we started, it was like all hands on deck. Like we have to turn in the Artemis album you know, in a couple weeks so that we can release it. And the funniest thing is like the, the dumb question I had was like, wait, why do we have to turn in the album now if it's out in like three, four months from now? You know, you never, you never like think of those things from the outside. Um, right. And so, like, I mean, so that, first, that, that first period was just wild. Mm -hmm. I think like the same week that I started to work with you, you had a show in San Diego and I got to bring my parents out to it. And so they got to like fangirl over you that same week. So it was like the funniest, like I'm getting my adult job and introducing my parents to everyone the same week. <laughs> you know, like it's like I'm not mature enough to do it on my own. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that was a, a wild time. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so many fun memories. And actually, hold on. I think we have, um, I'm going to take a, an extra fan call in right now because we have someone who's in the waiting room. So oh, yes. Who do, we, who do we have? Let me see. I actually, I'm having trouble reading the name, so let's wait till it pops up. It says, um, it's, uh, hold on. Try inviting him one more time. Okay. Let's see. It says they joined, but I can't see them. When I joined, it like kicked me out for a second. It took a sec, so. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. It says see. that they've joined. I don't know. I thought we might have a fun like fan question. Oh, also there, in the there, there he is. It's a it's a Mako. I think is his name. <laughs> Can you hear me? I love this. Drum roll. Let's see. Let's see if you can figure out the technology behind. Let's see. It's tricky. By the way, everybody, this is actually not a fan call. And this is, um, this is Mako, who is actually Sammy's brother. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. We thought it'd be fun to... Well, Sammy, you're not surprised at all? <laughs> no, I knew it was happening before. I found out just moments ago. What? Ah. Uh. I was trying to make it a surprise. Um, well, well, while he's figuring this out, it is kind of funny that um, I've actually known Mako for like several years now. Um, and I knew Mako and had worked with him several times before I'd ever met Sammy. And so when Sammy was hired at first, I didn't even know that like you guys were related. It wasn't, it was just such a funny coincidence that I was like, wait, you're, you're Alex's brother. Anyways. It was very funny. The funny thing, too, from, from my end is I didn't know he was working with you, if I'm being honest. Um, we, like, I kind of interviewed with our company, Friends at Work and Adina and Jess, and, you know, like, went through all of those rungs. And it wasn't until the very end when they were like, oh, who's, who's Lindsay working with on, on this Artemis album? And one of them was Mako, because you guys did the Amy yeah. Lee song together. And I, I literally had to double take and go, like, 
like the producer and DJ Mako. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you know him? And I was like, yeah, that's my Stop little it. brother. <laughs> That is so funny that I didn't know that you didn't know that long. Um, yeah, it was funny, but I thought it was really cool that, you know, he didn't, you both decided, you're like, no, I want to make it on my own. I don't want my brother to like give a good word for me or like introduce me to people. Um, you know, you wanted to do this on your own and find a job on your own legs, which I thought is really cool, you know, and very admirable of you. Can Thank anyone you. Yes. So funny. Oh, oh, do we have oh, them? We oh my goodness gracious. Look at that. Oh, you're in. You're in the chat. How are you doing, Alex? I'm doing great. How is everybody? I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for putting up with my little phone thing. Oh, it's all good. We all have had our own issues, probably even today, like trying to figure out this tech. So, um, and we were talking about how old we are because of it. Um, but glad you made it and figured it out. Uh, where are you calling from today? I'm calling from North Hollywood, California. Ooh, are you at your studio? I'm at the studio. Yep. I'm just uh, just working at the stew. Oh, man. Magic happens in that room. That's where we wrote um, Love Goes On and On and um, uh, among other cool things that we're actually currently working on. So anyways, uh, have you been writing today? I've been writing today. Um, we also did a little one called Lose You Now. And uh, I think there might also be some new stuff happening. I'm not exactly sure, but I think you were here pretty recently. I was. I that seems to ring a bell. Maybe like last week I was there working on something else. I can't hmm. remember. It's foggy. It's always foggy. I know. Um, but I guess how is it being brothers in the same industry? Is that something that's fun? Do you think it's connected you guys more, or is it just kind of feel like nothing's changed um, because you guys, you know, kind of run different roles in your prospective careers? Oh, I don't actually have any brothers. <laughs> 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 it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I think he was just saying this before I hopped on. Um, the connection of you guys working together and you and I working together, weirdly enough, were completely unrelated and coincidental. And I think you and I were already uh, jamming a bit on Love Goes On and On. And then by the time he joined, I start seeing his name pop up in our email threads with your management. And I'm like, okay, what is going on? I don't even know if you knew at the time, but I was like, okay, this is not all right. Yeah something's going on that is just wild i mean they, everyone always says it's a small industry and i think that is like one of the best stories of it being a small industry that i've ever heard <laughs> it's true but i'm you it know was, it, it, the music industry is like scary and intense and i'm so and i look after my little brother and it's so nice that his first like launching point into the industry was uh was all you at friends at work um and with you because uh it gets it's way worse out there and it was just so nice that he uh, his first gig was a uh, with such a loving group of people it was also just like one of those, the funniest aha moments because I knew we were talking about it. It was like, oh yeah, I'm interviewing with a management company. And, and it was like, oh cool, that's that's nice. And then it's he was like, oh, I'm working with an artist right now. And it was Lindsay. It's like what you see in those TV sitcoms when like none of the characters know that they're actually dealing with the same person. And then there's the aha moment at the end. Um, right. But it also, like you said, it's like such a testament to somehow how, like how small the world is and how small music could be too. It's like the phrase I always use, you know, luck is when courage meets arachnophobia uh, or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a callback. <laughs> that's the quote. Okay, finally, someone got it right. Thank you. <laughs> Mako. Uh, oh, my gosh. So <clears throat> I guess I guess let's do it's kind of fun to have like a little party on here. I've never had like three people all at once. But, um, you know, I guess. uh Mako, we'll we'll start we'll start with you. What is it that you want to contribute to this industry? I'm going deep here. I'm asking a deep question. Like, what is your hope as an artist and a a producer? Yeah, what's your hope to contribute to the world and the industry through what you do? Uh, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, I don't know if I think about it that way. I mean, I I, I know that like everybody goes about this differently. And I, I see the way that you actually like go about your art form. And it's very much like outward, like you have such a direct relationship with your audience that is really beautiful. And for me, it's just kind of that like, that buzz I got in my stomach as a little kid when I'd listen to my favorite film scores, and I'd watch behind the scenes of composers working with orchestras. And I'd see that it's just like that stuff had such a profound impact on me. And the records that I listened to when I was really coming of age had 
such a significant impact on me that I just have this obsession with creating, recreating that feeling that those other artists and art forms gave me. Um, and it's like, kind of just the machine that drives all machines for me and it's just a forever search to just like rekindle that feeling um and then the byproduct is you get to actually share that material with the world and i think um it wasn't until a little later in life that i started to understand like how beautiful of an experience it can be to share music with people. And I think Lose You Now is one of the best examples of it because, um, you know, the material that we were drawing from was so real and so authentic and so uh, painful and beautiful. And it was true to your life. And the outpouring of stories from other people uh, that happened after that. It's just, it's so wild to see your Twitter feed, feed like filled with stories that people are talking about going through similar things in their lives. And when it's weird, cause I'm here in my little cubby in North Hollywood and you make a piece of music and you put it online and that's it. Like your real world experience is pretty narrow and it's not until you play shows or get that feedback that you go, Oh, holy cow, this lyric I wrote or this melody that I made, it really had an impact on something somebody out there in the world. Um, and I think that's the thing that you learn to like try and keep in perspective as you get distracted in your older career and like, you know, getting so caught up in, you know, what venues can I play and how many streams can I get? It's just the actual people that are listening to this music and staying connected to them. Mm, that's so beautiful. It's And yeah, it is really hard these days not to get caught up in all of that. But to really remember that like the reason we make music is for the one, like it's for the one person that gets touched by it or that feels seen by the art, you know? So <clears throat> that's always such a good reminder that it, it really is about the one. It's not about the, the big, the big picture and the big numbers and all that. Um, but yeah, uh, Sammy. And I've got a question. I've got a question for both of you guys off that too. Cause like, do you, what, what brings those moments for you guys when you can kind of look back and not necessarily say like, I've made it, but like, yeah, I just, I did that for the right reason. Like, I feel like Lose You Now is such a great, great collaboration between you two and it touches on all of that. Like, do you get to appreciate that when it's out and get a moment to like, listen and, and feel like you, you did it, you made it? Uh, like what causes that for you guys? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. Well, I'll share one thing that for me, I, I'm so grateful for live performing because there's, you know, such a connection that you can feel when you are in front of an audience. And, and, you know, I, I do enjoy, I think almost every show I've ever done, like I've enjoyed it and I've gotten to feel that connection with my audience. But then there's been a few, there's sometimes when for some reason there's an extra special, like really powerful energy that you can't even define why it was more that night or why it was, you know, stronger or why you felt so drawn to certain people in the crowd that you kept making eye contact with. And, you know, there's just a certain amount of connection that comes from art and from real people and being able to see and feel those those emotions that you're putting out and that they're feeling back to you and i don't know there's this, this incredible connection and when i feel that in its truest form it is interesting because it's not usually it's not always the biggest shows sometimes it's the more intimate small shows that i really reminded nah this is why i do this this is why like me and this person right there this is why i love this um, I think I noticed that about you, Lindsay, from the very first time we met was how much like everything was an extension of yourself to be able to perform live. Um, and that's like so different than me because I'm terrified of performing and I don't do it too often. But it's really obvious to see the second I got to see your show when we played a little bit together um, in Orange County a couple of months ago, where it's just like, oh, the whole picture makes complete sense here. Um, do you feel that same way when you are nailing a music video piece or is that a different uh, form of fulfillment than what a li a great live performance is. For me, it's it's super different. When I'm on a music video set, I'm like super locked in to like just like go mode. I don't know. It's like I, I can kind of see the picture from start to finish, and I'm just trying to chase it. Um, is kind of my music video mode where I'm like, all right, we need this, we need this. Dancers do that. You know, I go so into like the clinical um, little director artist mode um and less it's a lot less about like the feeling and the emotion i'm like always hoping that that gets captured um but yeah that's why i think there's such separate entities in my mind i don't know but yeah. that makes so much sense to me um 
because like I, my relationship with music and to Sammy's question about asking like if you, if you did it or if, or, or feeling content to make music and make videos as well, because your relationship to time is so different than when you're playing a live performance. Like with a live performance, there's this element of in the moment, like I am sharing this specific moment with everyone. And when you're mm -hmm. making a recorded piece of art, uh, you don't know when or where or what environment somebody else is listening to it. Um, and you don't enjoy the thing in tandem with them. So you don't get to breathe with them and, and experience right. the song and then the beat that happens afterwards. It's just going on somewhere else without you knowing. And it could be going on in a bunch of places at once. Um, and it's also by the time an artist releases a song, you've gone through this like, hero's journey of like being inspired absolutely getting stuck hating the idea refinding it and being ignited again mixing it and mastering it and now you've heard the song ten thousand times and it's time for everyone else to hear it for the very first time and uh it, that also like we're it's an unfair balance because our audience is listening to the song with very fresh years and we're like i could be weathered and beaten up by a thing so i've learned that like the the it's the same thing with life. Like the accolades and the highlight moments aren't really the things that fulfill you. It's just like the journey along the way of being like beautifully distracted in your art form. And like the journey of making a song like Lose You Now and first coming up with that vocal and sending it to you and, and like getting the reaction that you guys had was just one very powerful phase. And then it was getting back in the studio and finishing it. Like all those moments were really important for me. And that's basically what kind of feeds that, that little like butterfly in my stomach that I was talking about earlier. But it's, it's so much different than what a live performer gets to experience when they play that show, look at that audience member in the face and, and just go through this thing together at the same time. Absolutely. Um, I'm also curious how you feel when you watch your music in tandem with the visuals of like the shows that you've written for. Because, um, you know, for those who don't know, Mako was like hugely involved in the creation. I believe you were the music director of the Arcane series and now you're working on the second series. And so like, what was that like to sit in that theater and watch the premiere and see it all together for the first time? You know, what's kind of funny is that that was probably where my the closest version of a performance goes for me. Like we got to watch the premiere in a packed theater with a bunch of people for the first time. And it was the perfect kind of performance because my job was done. I just got to sit there and enjoy it at the same time as everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that was so freaking cool. And it's probably one of the interesting distinctions between like film and television is that um, television. A record on Spotify where just people are experiencing it and you have no idea. Whereas a movie theater or actual theater does have like this this community aspect to it. And I loved watching Arcane in the first three episodes at the premiere with a theater full of people. And then I don't really know what else was going on beyond then. Um, I watched mm -hmm. it at home with my family. And, um, you know, people do like reaction videos and stuff on YouTube, which is really cool. But it's it, then it went back to feeling a little bit like releasing a piece of music, which is like, you know, you get YouTube comments and feedback and, and that's super rewarding. But you just kind of learn that the real beauty of it all was making it with the people that you make it with. Yeah. No, it, it is interesting. I feel like when stuff gets released and you kind of get that high from like, oh my gosh, it's out there. It's interesting to like kind of come down from that high because there's no real climax of it a lot of times. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like all this work and this thought goes into it. You release it and then, it, like you said, you don't really know what happens from there. Um, do you ever feel that kind of a like not knowing what to do with that high experience? I don't know if that makes sense, but do you understand what I'm trying to say? Oh, it makes complete sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I really think about that as just like this series of dopamine releases that you just kind of get trained to keep chasing. And like when you're an artist, it's insane. It's such a, a burden to deal with because you want to be in the spotlight and you want to express yourself and express your art. And so you get these waves of feedback and 
Obviously, sometimes they're really negative and that can be incredibly challenging to overcome. And equally challenging is when they're really positive and you just release a record and everybody's talking to you and listening to you. That's easy. It's easy to exist there. And then the second everybody's heard it and it starts to fade away and people aren't talking about you as much and you don't know if anybody's listening to the music. That's really that's really difficult to deal with. And it's like really life lesson stuff for me is just kind of like separating the sort of dopamine hit successes with the sort of properly fulfilling ones. And I think for everyone, you got to figure out which experience you've just had goes in which bucket. But I've learned that like, I can't really base my self-esteem off of the dopamine ones because it's just such a slippery slope and it's, it's pretty erratic. Like I can actually get quite, quite, uh, you know, ecstatic and I can be quite low and it's just a tough place to exist in daily life. So I just kind of learned that like the fun part is, is, is just the daily life of nobody's even paying attention to me and I'm just getting lost. And, and we, you and I talked about like flow state at our last session together and just what that feels like. Like that's kind of like a more fulfilling version of it and accolades and numbers and those things are, are nice. I mean, it's, it's never going to be awful to experience those, but you, you just try not to like lean into that and indulge that feeling too much. That's a really good way to put it, like not leaning in too much because if you, you know, I, I just think that sometimes the muscle of working on yourself and your happiness, um, just being you that's fulfilling that and you, like all the things that are real, um, you know, and your own self-esteem and your self-awareness, like that muscle gets a little bit weaker when you, or I guess the practice of using that gets a little weaker when you rely too much on the fact that, oh, I go on stage every night for this entire month and I get these huge dopamine hits and these big crowds applaud for me, or, you know, I'm seeing people react to whatever I'm putting online. And then if it stops, suddenly you realize the muscle of taking care of yourself has gotten weak and, you know, it can just be a really dangerous place to sit in, I think. And I, I just think you explained it really, really well. So that's yeah, a really beautiful way to put it. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, do you have any practices or anything you go to to help you not fall into that space? The biggie for me was um, going into therapy over COVID. Um, just kind of like everyone's going crazy and we're all just like, what What in the world is going on? And um, I just started doing Zoom ones and it was just a fabulous time to kind of explore. I, I, I think everybody's experience in therapy can be pretty different. But for me, it was just poking around in my old head. And, and when I get really low, just actually like deliberately trying to figure out what's going on there. And a lot of that kind of, relieves a lot of the pressure already as soon as I can actually recognize when I get into my low places and when I get into my high places. But then the flip side is I just got somebody I can talk to that actually knows me and has built a storyline with me and can also suggest things along the way. Um, and it's like hugely helpful to to dive into that. I don't know. I, I gained a whole lot from it. Um, and that's just personally something I did. And, you know, there's so many other things like, you know, like nurturing the friendships that you have in your community and, and being able to get away from yourself and your ego and the art forms that take up most of your day is such an important thing. Taking breaks, going on vacations. There's so many things that can like help kind of like ease all that pressure back. A hundred percent. I Yeah. Like you, like you said, there's a million different ways to do different things, but I think that the key fact is like you said in the beginning, recognizing, Oh, like what I'm feeling is abnormally sad or abnormally dark or, you know, like, or this high isn't something that I should expect to last. Like just understanding your own state and your own mental awareness, I think is the most powerful thing. And then what you do with it is all like, there's a million different ways to go about it. Um, but uh, I would actually love to play Lose You Now since we have you on our show today. And, you know, I haven't awesome. gotten to play this on the AMP show yet. So, um, Want, I want to talk really quickly about just how this song originated. originated. Um, but uh, yeah, I wrote a song called Guardian. It was it just always felt really special. I wrote it really trying to capture the spirit of my dad and the fact that I believe he's my guardian angel. And I had told Mako about this, you know, the whole album, kind of where it came from, what it meant to me about my angels and like my beliefs from that. And um, and then without me even knowing it, my management sent him that instrumental and said, hey, would you want to try to write some lyrics over it? And then I'll let you take it away from here, um, Mako, of like kind of how the lyrics came and, you know, what your experience like was like with the song. Um, it, it was really, really special. I mean, I still really remember it because 
I, it wouldn't have really occurred if I didn't already know you. Like we had developed such a nice relationship together by working on Lose You Now and just hanging out. Like we would just start our sessions and just talk for like, felt like three hours before we'd actually get to work. Like we're such procrastinators because we're just chatty. Um, and it was, it was just like really nice to like actually understand because artists might come through and you don't really get to know them as people. You just kind of, you know, work for two hours at a time and then you guys go about your ways. But I really felt like I got to know you. And so when I saw that brief, um, I was just really touched by it. I felt like I could take a stab at it because I, I actually had an idea of who you are and how you look at the world and how you, you know, deal with things that are very challenging. Um, and I, I don't remember exactly how, like, there's some motifs in that thing about like one by one and stuff like that, that just started popping up and it, it all happened very quickly. I, I, I don't know. Everybody's different, but like when you're really inspired, like things just kind of fall out so easily. Um, and I was, I was just very inspired and very touched by the idea of it. Um, and you know, there was things that you ultimately have to figure out when it's a Lindsey Sterling record, like where does the violin go? You know, how does this song interact with guardian, you know, which her audience already knows, but none of that stuff really mattered for starters. It was just about, um, getting down, you know, a vocal where the lyrics felt like they said the message and a melody that just felt like it was communicating the kind of emotion that it it should, which for knowing you, it needs to be very beautiful and uplifting. Ultimately, you're a very positive person. Um, and even with subject material, that's like very difficult to deal with it. It all, you're always looking for that sort of light at the end of that tunnel. Um, and so I, I don't remember if we even really needed to make too many changes as soon as they played it for you. I just, I just, it was probably one of my favorite moments in a long time, just knowing that um, you and your team had listened to it and were really touched by it. Like that was kind of the peak for me and uh, everything else was so fun, but that just like, that meant so much. That was just such a memorable experience. Yeah. I, I remember the first time I heard it, like, like I said, I didn't even know that anyone was really working on it. I think my management had told me that they were going to send it to some writers and I was like, cool, you know, but I'd forgotten about it because it was months prior. Um, and it was like late at night, I had just finished a fitting and literally it's like almost, I think it was after midnight or almost midnight. And my manager, Adina, just was like, I want to play you something real quick. And I just started bawling as soon as I heard the lyrics and um, I've never reacted to a song like when I'm, you know, something that I was a part of like that. Um, and I think I even called you and I was like, I know it's late. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> It was incredible. So, you know, I know, I know. And like, also, it's weird to, I, this has only happened to me a handful of times where somebody else sort of like randomly brings their art form without me knowing it into something I'm doing and just being like, oh my gosh, because I think you and I are both like very particular and I, I don't want to say like control freaks, but like we have very specific visions. And I think mm -hmm. a lot, you and I both do a lot of our work by ourselves. Like, not only to just sort of like spare people from like the, like having to just like figure out what the heck we're talking about, but also just because like, you know, you can do it right. I know you edit a lot of your videos for the same kinds of reasons. Like it's just fun to have your fingertips in there. And it's a really surreal experience to have without knowing just somebody else do something artistic and bring it to you and just be like, that's, that's what I want. That's great. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with all of that. Um, so with, with that, I would love to play Lose You Now. Uh, by Lindsay and Mako. Oh, it still gives me the feels every time I hear it. It get, makes me kind of emotional, even after how many times of playing it and hearing it. Um, but I just love it. So special. I really, um, I really love this. Super proud of it. And also, I was uh, just flipping through them the other week, and uh, the acoustic one as well. Like both of these two versions are just so lovely for me. Yeah, the acoustic one was really special too. Um. And you have such a good voice. Like, it's crazy to me that you don't, well, one, that you get so nervous to sing on stage, but also, um, you know, like, you are more in the producer role now, right? You're, are you finding that that's where you want to spend most of your time nowadays? Or do you still want to pursue your artist project? Oh man, that is a, that is a question for the ages right now. Um, I, <laughs> I, it's, it's, I actually don't have an answer for that. I've been having so, so much fun, um, working on Arcane and, uh, you know, making records with you and with other folks. Like I really, really like being in studio. I really like writing, like writing is just so mm. my, my thing, whether it's songwriting or, you know, music writing and production and film scoring. Um, and it's hard because I, uh, I loved making records and I love going on tour and I love like my fan base is so beautiful, but, 
um, it's uh, it's just hard when you like only have 24 hours in the day and you're just like, yeah. you know, completely inspired by something. I, I, I think you guys were talking earlier about just like how to navigate your way through life and your career. And for me, it's always just been follow just whatever the heck is inspiring me um, and kind of don't ask too many questions. And, you know, I just I'm, I'm having so much fun with what I'm doing that I, I really want to get back to uh, making another album at some point soon. Oh, but That's you know, awesome. I, yeah, That's I just, I, I, gotta, I gotta get past season two of Arcane and then, and then hopefully get it going. <laughs> right. It's true. It's, it is never ending. Um, and I guess, um, you guys both have really great voices like you and Sammy, cause I've heard Sammy sing as well. And, um, did you guys ever sing together when you were younger or when you were teenagers? Was that something that you guys did? Let me just say something. Sammy well, has a way better voice than I do. He's an incredible singer. <laughs> and he would go play coffee shops as a little kid. I'll let him talk about himself, but he will shock you with how great he sings and writes. I was going to say, I think the important way to answer your question, Lindsay, of did we like collab growing up is to ask Alex, what did he actually play growing up? <laughs> so, um, so we didn't sing together because I was busy trying to be a professional French horn player, which went nowhere. <laughs> oh my gosh, I forgot that. I forgot you went to Juilliard, right, for French horn yeah. performance. Yep, I, I, I have a bachelor's degree in French horn performance, which is one of the most valuable degrees <laughs> you can have out there in the workforce. Oh my gosh, that's that's amazing. The French horn is no joke. It's so beautiful and also so hard to play. Um, yep. Well, so I want to say it's right up there with the violin in uh, technicality. Um, but uh, so wait, you guys never did like because I remember growing up, my sisters and I all played musical instruments. Like one of my sisters played the trumpet, um, and then I played obviously the violin, and my sister played the cello. But and we would find ways to like make violin, cello, um, you know, trumpet arrangements, and occasionally play for like church activities or whatnot. But you guys never did like singer songwriter French horn performances. <laughs> I think the biggie is that um, Sammy and I are seven years apart. So I was um, just doing French horn trumpet stuff. And then he gravitated towards guitar first, I want to say, and then vocals. But yep. by the time Sammy was really like rocking with it, I was probably already off to college. Like it would, if we were close in age, it completely would have turned into something like that, I think. Yeah. And the, the fascinating thing to me is that like I, I didn't hear you sing for forever. I don't even, I'm very curious actually now, like when did you actually start doing that? Cause he growing up, Lindsay, he was, you know, French horn and composing like film score stuff. Uh, in all honesty, I don't know if he listened to anything besides classical music until the age of like 23. Like it, the <laughs> only thing I ever heard from him was classical music. And we'd, I'd go and watch him play uh, at concert halls and stuff. And then I got to think like it was just one day, maybe in the middle of college or something. He was like, hey, let me play you something I made. And it was like one of his like demos with probably like piano and just singing. And I remember my first reaction was like, dude, I just started singing two years ago. Are you really going to try and take this from me too? <laughs> <laughs> Is, and I think that's the big difference, too, is that I never really like I still don't really think of myself as like a singer singer. I just I write in my studio and I got my little protected space here and I'll sing into the microphone and edit the vocals and make them sound good. Like what Sammy does and so many singers do is like that's proper musicianship. And I think that's why I have a lot of anxiety about performing in general. Um, and I, I felt like a late bloomer to it, too. Like Sammy was saying, I, I didn't really start until after I had graduated college. So it was like 22, 23 years old. And I started futzing around with like writing vocals for DJs with other singers, um, just started mm -hmm. learning how to write songs. And then um, it got to a point where I would just record myself as like a demo vocalist before getting a male singer. And just nobody would really say anything like nobody would be like, all right, let's get a proper singer. So I'd kind of sneak in the back door there. And then uh, I like released one or two as like my artist project and nobody seemed too upset. So just kind of like <laughs> trickled into view. So it's, it's something that I, I really love doing and I, it's like a really deep part of my, my tool belt, but it's, it's uh, I, I still, I, I'm not like, I'm not like the pros out there. Like listening to Sammy saying, you're like, that's, I could listen to that all day and he can just do it whenever he wants. And that's, that's something that's really badass. Yeah. I, Sammy, I think it's, still... it's... Oh, go on. Oh, sorry. Go for it. 
Oh, I was just going to ask, do you still write music? Because I know that in the past you've written music and, you know, you've even like shown some stuff on social media occasionally of like little things you've tinkered around with. So is that something you still do? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the thing I have to say first before that is, Alex, you're an amazing singer and everyone always talks about like how good your voice is. So I think it's like, I think it's the coolest thing ever. It's kind of like, Lindsay, how you talk about how you started dancing when you were like, 20, wait, how old were you when you when you first started dancing? I was uh, 23. Yeah, right. Like, I think that part of both of your guys' chapters is so inspiring because we have this picture in our mind that, like, you guys were doing that since you were, like, you know, nine years old and you made it there. Like, I think it's so cool to hear that, like, at the age of 23, something that, like, you're very well known for was, like, you just started diving into it at the, at the like, first time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely love writing and singing and playing. Um, and it's so funny. I almost do it like half from a research point of view now. Cause it's like, mm. I want to understand how, how musicians feel about art and stuff. Like it's such an interesting process, like creating a song and then living with it for so long. So like, um, funny enough, my, uh, both Alex and my, my dad, uh, he started this thing like forever ago where Tuesday nights is his like work late night. Um, and ever since we were growing up, we knew just Tuesday nights, like he's going to just be at the office super late and he'll just, that's his like night to just do whatever, you know, he needs to get done that he doesn't have the time to. Um, and so I've kind of adopted the same thing now where it's like, mm. whenever, whenever it makes sense for a Tuesday, of course, like I'll finish my work day and my roommates and my girlfriend know this. It's like a don't bug Sammy day. It's like, I, go in and I am like, I'm going to write a song. And so I try to keep at that at least once a week, just like every Tuesday go in and, and just try and write a song. And also like the nice thing is it's for the appreciation and love of it rather than like, I'm going to make it big someday. I'm like, I'm going to just do this because it's in, like a great creative outlet. Mm, that's amazing. I need to hear some of these songs if you ever want to share. Like I know it's your creative okay, outlet. Absolutely. You don't you don't have to share, but if, if you ever want to, I'd love to hear the stuff you write because just the little snippets I've heard here and there, I'm like, dang, Sammy's really good at this. Like, I, I forget that you're like an amazing musician alongside being like a really great manager. Um, oh, thank you. And, you know what? I think there's something so cool about that. Like the idea that hobby, like hobbies don't have to become your bread and butter like a lot of times people are like oh i'd give anything to like you know be a performer or write music or do all this and um i feel so so lucky every day that what i love to do became my career but at the same time i guarantee you if i wasn't a professional at this I would still be doing a lot of the things I do. And I know that because I've done them my whole life. I've always made quirky little videos since I first got my hands on editing software. And I've always made arrangements of songs just for fun, even if no one was going to hear them, you know? So there's something to be said for like, well, just because it's not your bread and butter doesn't mean you can't still do it. Like there's still hobbies I have that I do just for the sake of having a hobby. And I think that's really important. And, and to bounce off that, music is such a funny one to me because I think like right now, kind of in the era of social media that we're at, everyone, it feels like if you're posting your music, it, it's like you're trying to do it so you could go viral. And I'm like, I don't want that feeling around it. Like, I, I mm. love that people just create music just because they want to. Like, I, I love whenever any of my friends are like, they're going to learn guitar, but like, they're not going to be a guitarist. Like, they just want to learn it just to appreciate it, you know? Yeah, that's such a good point that it does seem like anytime someone does anything, even if they post a video of them like dancing in their house, it's like, oh, they're hoping to get the views. It's like, or they exactly. just were having a good time and wanted to share it with their friends, you know, like <laughs> there's value, there's something there too. Um, how do that, you guys... I have, a question. I have a question for both of you guys off Ooh. that, if, yeah. if you will. It's, I'm really curious what your guys... So to, to take a step back, I feel like at least from a business standpoint, watching songs come to life is like schoolhouse rock. I'm just a bill. It's like you get to see it like, you know, start as a demo and then maybe it will get produced out and then maybe it will get released. It's like there's so many songs out there that never become a bill and like don't get released. 
And it's, it's fascinating watching all of the different steps of it. And I'm curious what, what your guys' favorite part of the process is. Like, I feel like there's a writing process and then there's the creative process and then there's the release process. Like, what to you guys brings you the most joy? Well, I think for me, it's de- no, hands down the writing part. It's kind of interesting because um, I think this is like uh, about, you know, Lindsay and your management. And I think for other people out there, it's it's an interesting uh, relationship, um, um, an artist and their manager, because the artist is sort of the busiest when they're actually making the thing. And then the manager's gig just flicks on as soon as the song's done and it's time to actually come up with a release plan, work a record. And I, I don't know how common knowledge this is, but like, you know, big songs, they need to get worked on by a team of people to help market it and promote it for like sometimes like six months after the song releases. So like anytime a song is successful, there's like so many reasons that that things went well and so many people working really hard to make it go that way. And then there's also, you know, the off chance that something goes viral or hits TikTok or whatever. Um, But I think I, to a fault, love the writing process so much that I tend to be like, all right, it's done. I want to move on to something else. Whereas, you know, really great artists know that, okay, now I need to flick into what Lindsay does, which is like all the other art forms I love. I need to make a video. I need to learn how to perform this. I need to make TikToks for it. Like the, uh, the creative experience through a song is, is really crazy. Yeah, I I admire and envy so much the artists that love the writing process because that is definitely not where I thrive. I feel like I have to kind of like literally pet myself up in the car before I go into a writing session and be like, you got this. You are smart and good at this <laughs> and proficient. You can do this because um, the writing part is just always been a little bit hard and, you know, uncomfortable for me. And that's why I love working with people like you that I, I know, and I trust, and I can feel more comfortable with. Um, But yeah, for me, my favorite part is for sure the creativity. Like once I know that, oh, I like this little, this embryo of a song, like even if it's not done yet, I can usually tell if I like it. And then for me, it gets so exciting to think of like, what's it going to be? Like, where do we take it? What kind of video? How will it look in the show? You know, that's when I get super excited. You know, and I guess, Sammy, right back at you, um, as a manager, what's your favorite part of the process? Because like uh, Alex was saying, you know, there's just so many different layers to being a manager, first of all, of the different hats you have to wear, like from having good taste, you know, and helping kind of these songs get to the finish line to knowing how to market it and how to ugh, all the things that go into getting it approved and blah, blah, blah. So what's your favorite part of the process? Totally. That's a good question. And Alex, it's a good point that it's like, sometimes you just have to like change your brain, especially it's like, you know, the managers click on for release mode uh, when the songs are like ready to go. But then also like before the songs are out, kind of like part of the like coming up with the ideating of like, what's what music do we want to like, you know, try to create as a mm-hmm. team and, and stuff. And I think, I think my favorite that's such a good question and i i know you've asked me this before and i think i struggled with the answer too i think my favorite part is like the beginning part of the music when it's all coming together and we're starting Mm -hmm. to figure out where it's all headed and like Lindsay, i don't know if, if you've talked about it yet now that now that it's out now that the christmas album is officially out by the way go stream i have to do the manager duty of saying go stream snow waltz everywhere go buy it on target go buy it on your store (laughs) Um, but that month like that period where where that album had to get like put together was so crazy and i i absolutely loved it i thought it was so fun trying to like you know we were like the assignment i'd love for you to just talk about how you created a Christmas album because the assignment of like, what classics do you take? What new songs do you take? Like, how do you reimagine that? Like, that was such a fun experience. I would love for you to recite it as well. Now that Snow Waltz is out in the world. Yes. Well, thank you for the plug, Sammy. Appreciate it. Um, Of course. You know, I, I will say also, I think every artist has such a different relationship with their managers. And I'm really grateful that like, like you were saying, Sammy, my management team is really involved in like kind of helping me figure out these processes. And I may be the one that's like in the studio writing the music, but I do rely heavily on saying, what do you guys think? 
am I on to something? Like, I don't know. I kind of need that feedback of like, we love this. Oh, we're not feeling that. You know, it's like I, I sometimes get so lost in these projects that I stop being able to see kind of through the weeds. And I, I know what I love and I know what I hate, but sometimes in the middle there, I get a little bit lost. Um, and so I'm really grateful for my team kind of helping me figure these things out and like sammy helps me with all the mixes at, at some point i'm like i can't tell anymore if that bell is too loud or, or too soft so um but i guess coming you know through snow walls it came together super fast i am sammy i don't even remember when did we start like when did we decide we're gonna make a christmas album we actually should go back and kind of put out the calendar of like when was that let's make a Christmas album meet to like when did it get turned? It felt like it happened in less than two months, you know? I think it did. I think it was mid February was when all of a sudden we were like, let's switch gears and do a Christmas album. And I was super excited. It just it just felt right. Um, and yeah, it all I'm really grateful that because of COVID, I learned how to produce like limited stuff but i you know some things myself i learned how to make demos i learned how to record myself really well um and so it gave me the ability to just from my own home whenever i wanted like late into the night because that's when my mind is the most alive i feel like um i'd be writing these arrangements and figuring out like okay i really want a celtic song what christmas classic sounds the best in a celtic style and just really playing around with like what songs can overlap on top of each other Ooh, these two you know Deck the Halls and Silent Night sound really cool when they're played on top of each other, you know? So just almost treating it like a puzzle, like all these covers are out there, all these styles, and just trying to figure out how you could meld them all um, was, I don't know, really fun for me. And and it was really fun to also work with like Sammy and Jessica and just kind of bouncing back and forth ideas all the time on the album. It did feel like probably one of the most like team oriented projects we've ever done. I'm trying to unmute here. Yeah, totally. I totally agree. And it was so fun. Like, I think just going through and listening to like some of the songs off that album of like how reimagined they really got and how there's probably versions of those that sit in a Dropbox that were completely different directions that were like, no, that's not the right version of that song. And then it got reimagined and created yeah. to be like the fun thing like that. That was such a fun kind of process and experience overall. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the ones that definitely came the farthest and had the most iterations was um, Sleigh Ride. I sent you, Sammy, particularly some really weird iterations of Sleigh Ride. It was the last <laughs> one. I was kind of burnt out. It all happened so fast. We're getting close to the deadline. And I really wanted to do Sleigh Ride. And I just sent you, I, I know I sent you some really odd, like, swing style versions of uh sleigh ride and like all kinds of weird stuff <laughs> that's so funny i really wish at some point there's a movement for artists to just play demos of the songs that like you know didn't make like the first versions of them or the ones that didn't make a cut too because it's it's also hilarious watching like where a song goes yeah you know who's really good at or who does that sometimes it, not f showing full demos but bonnie mckee actually will go on TikTok and she'll show all the lyrics that they thought about putting in like teenage dream or something and she'll say this was the first chorus and she'll like read off the lyrics and it's really interesting to see um you know a process unfold like that to see how great songs come to be it's through tons and tons and tons of revisions of one process yeah totally that that's so fascinating and i'm i'm curious what is cre creating like a, a christmas song like for you versus creating like you know whatever your newest song's gonna be or like a non-christmas song like is it a different experience i think a hundred percent i i find it a lot um personally a lot easier to reimagine things i mean i think it probably would be for almost anyone i'd actually be curious to see for mako but you probably don't do this i i've done a fair amount of covers or you know arrangements of existing music in my day and i find that to be a muscle that i'm really good at exercising it's it's a lot more fun for me than writing original music because it's like oh i understand the assignment and like the song the melody's already here i just get to reimagine it in whatever style i want to and it's so fun for me 
But um, Mako, have you ever done much with arranging and do you like arranging existing music? Yeah, you know what's kind of funny is um, I, I started my project with Mako as a DJ thing. And in the culture of DJ world, like making mm-hmm. mashups and uh, remixes of songs is like a huge aspect of, you know, living and working as a DJ. And <clears throat> like if it, when I play DJ sets like the one I played um, a few months ago with you, um, there's tons of just custom things that I've made together where I'm not writing anything. I'm just grabbing this vocal from this song that I think is in the right key and the right vibe for this other thing over here. And you can really surprise people with it and it's a little similar to what you're doing when you're coming up with covers but it i really like that sort of more editorial high level kind of aspect because uh it's it's a fun muscle it is different like you're saying yeah it's totally different and um yeah there's just something fun like you said about being able to surprise people because with an original song it's like you know they've never heard this melody before they've never heard the production so why wouldn't it be that way this is just the way it is but when you're taking you know, an existing song that everybody knows and you get to throw in a mashup and like really take people by surprise or throw in a style that they've never heard it in. You get this element of like, like you said, surprise that is kind of fun to play with, I think, when, you know, versus writing an original. It just feels so different. You know what the kind of funny version of this is that's been really popular the last couple of years is watching like a movie trailer and hearing, you know, a Beatles song or something like that. But instead of the peppy normal version you're used to, it's like this slowed down, haunting female vocal trailer version. Um, and when that first started happening, it was like this massively creative novelty. And now it's been one of those things that's just sort of so played out like many things. But it's just like a perfect example of like taking that because when there's a familiarity that your audience already has with it, that's like, that's like an energy in a song that is yeah. really interesting. And it's like when you hear a street musician and all of a sudden they're playing Desposito, like you just, your brain connects to it in a different way than if it's totally. just a random song you never heard before. No, for sure. It, it's so true. And it gives you a little bit of an advantage too. Cause you're like, yeah, you guys know this already. I, I got you <laughs> just because it's iconic, you know? <laughs> totally. Um, well, Let's see, before we have to end, I think we should play one piece of music because I asked Sammy to give me several songs that he wanted to play on the show. Oh, no. And so, oh, no. Well, no, I thought you could uh, get, introduce one of your picks. Okay, okay, okay. Do I get a pick or are you going to pick which one? You get to pick and you get to introduce it. Mm, okay. All right. How about this? I'll, I gave you three songs. I will, I'll tell which three songs I gave. I gave you John Mayer, I think, because he's my OG guy. Um, Have you seen John Mayer live? You what? Wait, I know you've seen John Mayer live. Uh, But um, how is it seeing John Mayer live? Are you a big fan of his live shows? He's amazing. He was the first concert I ever went to that wasn't a classical concert. Um, And he is just like so good. If you, have you gotten to see him live? I have only once, but he was amazing. So good. Alex, have, Alex and Fish, have you guys seen him live? I saw him one time with you um, oh, years yeah. ago. You were, you were a little tyke, but we saw him somewhere in San Diego. <laughs> Fish, oh. have you seen him live? I have never seen John Mayer live. Nope. All right. Sorry to make this a John Mayer advertisement, but I think <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. I will say he did a lot less dancing than I prefer in shows, <laughs> but he was. He was great at the guitar and his vocals were amazing. <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah. He, let's, let's play some John Mayer to play it out. That's a, that's a good, uh, good last way to do it. I, I fell in love with him because of his guitar work and you know, how he interweaved it with uh, vocals and everything. So I would be happy if we, uh, if we play some John Mayer to end the show. All righty. Well, John Mayer it is. We're going to play Why Georgia. That was a song Sammy requested. Um, but before we play, I just want to um, thank you guys for coming, being on the show and uh, chatting. This was so fun. I felt like it was you know, just an extra treat to have the brothers here today. And I still want to have a cooking stream on <laughs> Twitch with both of you. I think that would just be the icing on the cake of my, my career. <laughs> Let's do it. Thanks so much for having me. I have no idea if anybody's enjoyed me being on here. But I hope anybody listening now had a great time and it was a, a real pleasure. Um, so thanks, y'all. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. And um, hopefully I'll get to talk to you guys both soon. But for now, this is John Mayer.
Man, he really does just have a voice that takes me back to like, I feel like he was so, so iconic for like that growing up period of our generation. I know we're from completely different generations, Sammy, but still. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, serious enough. it's so recognizable. It is just that sound and that relax. I feel more relaxed now. I'm like, man, I need to make a John Mayer playlist for just whenever I'm feeling a little like Ugh, angsty. There we you go. Know? So anyways, well, thanks so much for being on here today. It was just so delightful to chat with you and to honestly even like hear some things that I didn't know about you before, even though we've traveled the world together as, you know, compadres. Um, also, so good to chat with you, Fish. Miss you. Can't wait till you come back to our oh, end of the country. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, everybody, thank you so much for joining in and for chatting with us today. Uh, before we leave, Sammy, is there anything else you want to tell your fans? That is it. You know what? I'm happy to be a backup guest whenever. Hopefully, um, I'll be <laughs> another, uh, make another appearance on the upside soon enough, and we'll do a part two. <laughs> oh, by the way, I meant to start with that. I meant to start with how I feel bad that anytime a guest falls through, I'm always like, uh, Sammy, can you do it? And then, <laughs> and then another guest, they're like, well, we have somebody else that might be able to do it. I'm like, oh, yeah, please, please, anyone else. <laughs> also, That's Sammy, right. I'm, I'm happy that we didn't continue our bit about pretending to hate each other because I can't keep that up. <laughs> Our feud, that's right. It'll it'll uh, reappear at some point. Yeah, at some point, at some point. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah, for everybody listening, I don't remember even how it started, but in France, we decided that they were at odds. And so for about, yeah. I don't know, three days, they pretended to like have a feud, but you know. Mortal enemies. <laughs> yeah, they were mortal enemies for a short time. I think they made one comment once we got back about, it and then it was over but and then we, I, I neither of us could Sam, commit to the day. Nice. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I, well you're both lovely so good to chat with you and um yeah we'll be back next week so we'll see you guys all next wednesday wait sammy is it is that on monday next week Ooh, great thank you for bringing that up so we will be seeing you on monday the 17th at 5 p.m pacific there we go there you we heard go. it from sammy he keeps me in check all right, we'll see you next Monday, everybody. Bye. Bye.